Okay, so last Gautam. time we uh, uh, introduced we, the... Uh, yeah, Gautam. Go ahead. Uh, am I... Uh, yeah, I'm audible, right? Uh, yes, yes, you are. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, one student had asked about creating a group. Uh, is that required? Should we ask uh, the people? Yeah, sure. So does the class, would the class like a WhatsApp group to be created for the course? Just uh, type yes, into the chat window. Yeah. If it's a yes, just type into the chat window, right? Um, so, okay. So I think Gautam, most people would like the WhatsApp group to be created. So how will you do this, Gautam? You will send the link to ah, the... Right. Yeah, so we have the role yeah. list. Uh, we'll add a few. I'll add a few more names to that, and you can send a bulk email, which is what I've been doing because, yeah, Moodle ah. is still, uh, yeah, it will still take some time for Moodle to stabilize. Yeah. yeah. Okay, guys, we'll create a group uh, by the end of this week. Ah, so right now I'll put the link here. Yeah, I'll put the link here and on Moodle, um, and okay. then Sounds send out a bulk good. email yeah. finally to get whoever was missed. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, sure. That'll be good. Thanks, Gautam. Was there anything else you wanted to say, Gautam? Ah, no, ma'am. That's it. That's it. Okay, okay. Thanks. Yeah, guys, so he's posting the link on the chat itself, so you can all click and join the group right away. Right, so just to recap, we introduced the idea of a quantum bit last time. Uh, and we said that this is uh, basically an object that is no longer just a number or a uh, binary random variable, but it is actually a vector in a linear vector space, uh, which we call C2 to denote that this is a two-dimensional complex linear vector space, okay? And we have two... Um, states, the zero state and the one state. And like I said, we call these as ket vectors or kets, right? Um, so we have the zero ket and the one ket, which are sort of the quantum analogs of your classical zero and one. But of course, they behave very differently. And the main, uh, the first important difference is the idea uh, of superposition, namely that I can write I down can write an arbitrary state arbitrary of a qubit. Uh, whoever it is, can you please mute I'm hearing my own voice back? Yeah. Can be written as alpha zero plus beta one, where alpha and beta are some uh, complex numbers. So there are further constraints on this, which we will see as I uh, actually formally define this and so on. Now I'm just trying to give a feel for what this course is about, right? So the first thing is to understand the nature of this quantum bit and to understand that there's this idea of superposition that comes into play. The next thing was we discussed was quantum gates, and that's where we stopped last time, right? And we realized that quantum gates must be some kind of linear transformations that is, classical gates are Boolean functions which map uh, either a single bit or multiple bits to a single bit output, typically, right? Quantum gates are linear transformations which have to act on vectors. So, a convenient way to represent, to this, represent this is using matrices. Using matrices. My echo has stopped now. Okay. Um, a convenient way to represent this is using matrices. And uh, we saw the simplest example of a quantum gate, which does the not operation. So like the classical not, this has to map 0 to 1 and 1 to 0. And we said that this is achieved. So in 
So I have to fix a representation, right? Now, if I say that I want to represent uh, quantum gates as matrices, I first have to represent my qubit states as vectors, right? As real, um, as uh, what I call column vectors, right? So we work in, so this is what I call the canonical or the standard representation. So this is to associate zero with uh, two column vector one zero and associate one with a vector zero one. These are basically two cross one matrices. And then in this representation, the X gate, which is what the quantum knot operation is called, is this two by two matrix, right? And I gave you a simple example of a circuit. Uh, this is how this will be represented in a circuit that I have some input state, I have the gate and I have the out, right? And this is some linear transformation and time flows from left to right. And I had asked you to work out what is the action of X on a superposition state of this form, right? So if I create a superposition state of the form one over root two zero plus one over root two ket one, and I will often simply represent this as zero plus one by root two, right? Then what is the output? Did all of you work this out? Yes, ma'am, it's, it's the same. It's the same. Now what happens when there is a relative minus sign? Minus of it minus of the Ah, minus of this. Very good. Okay, so these two superposition states become important, um, right? In general, so we will denote them with some special name. So I will call this the plus ket, okay? And I will call this the minus ket, okay? So what you have shown, hopefully all of you have checked this. Please just work this out, right? You have the matrix representation for zero, you have the matrix representation for one, and you have the matrix representation for the gate. It should be easy for you to work out these two steps. So what we have is to is that X acting on plus is plus, and X acting on minus is minus of minus. What do these kind of equations remind you of? Those of you who have done either quantum mechanics or linear algebra. Eigenvectors. Exactly. Very nice. So these are basically what we will call eigenvalue equations. Right? So while the X gate does something non-trivial to ket 0 and ket 1, namely it maps, it transforms 0 to 1 and 1 to 0, its action is trivial on superpositions of this form, plus and minus, right? So these plus and minus kets are essentially the eigenvalues of this linear transformation X. They are the eigenvalues of the matrix X, one with an eigenvalue plus one, sorry, the eigenvectors of the matrix X, one with an eigenvalue plus one, and the other with an eigenvalue minus one, right? And yeah, so we'll often be interested in looking at gates of this form, what uh, states do they act non-trivially on, what states do they act trivially on, right? So all of this becomes important. Okay, so this is the simplest quantum gate you can think of as an analog to the classical single bit gate, okay? Now, the interesting thing is your quantum single qubit gates do not stop there, okay? So the set of single qubit gates actually forms uh, an infinite um, uh, set in some sense, and they're all, um, so we'll identify this, uh, what this set is shortly, but there is an infinity of them, essentially, right? Because what are these gates? So basically, I need two by two matrices, right? That's what we have said. But over and above that, I actually need what are called unitary matrices. So not just two by two matrices, but what I need are a special class of 
two by two matrices called unitary matrices. And these are essentially parametrized by um, three real parameters. And so, and these are continuous parameters. So there is an infinite set of them essentially, right? They're, they're part of a continuous parameter space, the set of all single qubit gates, right? What are unitary matrices? We'll define them soon for those of you who don't know, but suffice it to say that not any two by two matrix will work, but we need some special class. But the point I want to make here is, whereas the classical case, you simply have one single bit gate, namely the not gate, right? Okay, so maybe I'll say only not and identity, right? That's what I said last time. The identity gate. How would I represent the identity gate in this case? It would be the two by two identity matrix, right? Which basically looks like this one zero zero one. So I have identified already the two gates which correspond to these two classical gates, right? But now I can introduce other gates. So here's a simple example of what is a truly quantum gate, right? This is what we will call a phase gate, okay? And I'll you'll see why now. So I'm going to write down a two by two matrix of this form, one zero zero minus one, okay? And I'm going to call this my Z gate or Z gate. Now, I want you to tell me what this does to our qubits zero and one. So what does this, what is the action of Z on zero, ket zero? And what is the action of Z on ket one? Can you quickly work this out and let me know? First will be zero and next will be minus one. Good. So Z acting on ket zero, remember ket zero is just one zero. And this is a diagonal matrix, so you can quickly do this matrix multiplication and you'll realize that it leaves zero invariant. And what it does to the one is it adds a minus one because of this minus one sitting here. So, excuse me. So now you understand the name phase gate, right? So this is adding some non trivial phase to get one. Now, also, you realize that in the process, you've identified the matrix for which zero and one are the eigenvectors, right? So these are again, eigenvalue equations, right? Um, and so essentially you've identified the matrix for which this ket zero and ket one form the eigenstates or the eigenvectors, uh, fine. But this, for those of you who know a little bit of quantum mechanics, this minus sign outside here is what we will often call an overall phase or an outside phase, right? So does this overall phase really matter? Is this gate really doing anything non-trivial? Well, it will do something very non-trivial once you act this on a superposition. So now I'm going to ask you again to consider this kind of a circuit picture where my input state is now the plus state. So can you tell me what the action of the Z gate on the plus state is? Yes, it's the minus, minus state. state. Very nice, yes, indeed. So this now gives me the minus state. And what is the action of the Z gate on the minus state? Plus. Exactly. So you see what the Z gate is doing is if I look at plus minus like this, the Z gate is flipping plus to minus and minus to plus. This has no classical analog, right? Because the idea that I can make a superposition with a non-trivial phase in between, right? So this non-trivial phase that sits in between here in the plus and the minus, this is what we would call a relative phase, okay? This is a relative phase between my two basis states zero and one, right? So what your Z gate is doing is what we will call a, oops, sorry, is what we will call a phase flip, okay? 
just like what the x k does is a bit flip right so the x gate um, does this right so i maybe i didn't mention this word last time so this is what we will call a bit flip it flips the state of the bit right from 0 to 1 and 1 to 0 what the z gate is doing is a phase flip right and we've already encountered a very simple example of a gate which has no classical analog right there's no idea of a relative phase and a phase flip right so you already see that there's a richness to the quantum bit and the quantum gate structure right now there are several more gates one can write down single qubit gates and we will indeed study several examples but i just want to remark on two things the fact that they belong to a continuous parameter family namely the set of two cross two unitary matrices the second fact that i want to remark on is that all single qubit gates are reversible okay now there's nothing very surprising about this if you think about the classical case well the not gate is indeed reversible right it takes 0 to 1 and 1 to 0 so if i apply the gate i know what the inverse operation is another way of thinking about it is if i look at the output i know what the input should have been right but now we'll come to a non trivial um, version of this statement where we will now talk about two qubit gates and we will note that all two qubit gates are also reversible and this again is a big departure from the classical case right um, any questions so far okay so now i just want to present an example of a two qubit gate sorry yeah, yeah nilesh you had a question yeah uh, and so in case when we are considering that minus cat one before phase flip yeah so yeah. It's, uh, cat one and minus cat one as a vector they are represented by zero one and zero minus one uh, right? yes yeah yeah so, so so they are two different vectors in the vector space so i mean they, they are they are two different states right or they are same uh no that's a good question Two different states in a vector, two different vectors in a vector space is correct, but physically speaking, they're not two different states. Okay, this is why I said when I write alpha zero plus beta one as the qubit, that is not the end of the story. Because for it to be a valid physical quantum state, there are other constraints that it has to satisfy. Okay, so physically, mathematically, indeed, what you say is correct ket1 and minus ket1 are two distinct vectors in the vector space but physically ket1 and minus ket1 correspond to the same state what does this mean it means that there is no measurement i can perform to distinguish between my ket1 and minus ket1 another way of saying it is that this so what distinguishes them physically is this phase factor but this overall phase factor is not an observable in quantum mechanics. It's not something that I can do a measurement and detect. However, what I can detect in quantum theory is what I call here this relative phase. I can indeed perform a measurement which will distinguish the plus ket and the minus ket. A simple physical way to think about it is if I have polarization states, if 0 and 1 correspond to horizontal and vertical, then plus and minus correspond to cross polarizations, 45 degree and 135 degree. So, of course, I can put filters which will filter out either 45 or 135 polarized light. And so I can unambiguously detect whether the light was 45 polarized or 135 polarized. I can separate these two states out. But what I cannot separate out are ket1 and minus ket1. Physically, they are impossible to distinguish. Okay. Does that answer your question, Neelish? Uh, yes. Yeah. yeah, this point will come up again when I formally do the qubit and two level quantum systems um, description. Okay, so I wanted to show you an example of a two qubit gate, right? And 
of course, again, let's do the quick classical checkup. So classically, we discussed this last time, you have all these gates, the or, the and, and the XOR. So actually what I'm going to show you is in some sense, a quantum version of the XOR gate, okay? Of course, classically, all these gates take two bit inputs. So the input is a two bit string and give you a single bit output, right? But quantumly, since these are all, uh, yeah, this is Manan, I see something in the chat. Yes, please ask me. Uh, yes, ma'am. So, uh, can you have to speak a bit louder, please. Uh, okay. Uh, am I audible? Yeah, yeah, you are now. Tell me. Yes, ma'am. So, uh, physically, what does cat zero and cat one are represented by? Like. So, well, I gave you a couple of examples last time. One example is uh, two polarization states of light: horizontally polarized light and vertically polarized light. Yeah, but. Uh, those are yeah. relative, right? Sorry? Those are relative to, right? What do you mean they are relative to? Oh, they're relative to some particular spatial direction. Is that what yes. you mean? Yes, yes indeed. They are relative to a particular spatial direction, but that's not what I mean by this relative phase. This is a relative phase inside the vector space, right? Um, it's a relative phase. So once I fix a physical X, Y, Z direction, then let's say that fixes for me what is horizontal and what is vertical. Now I'm talking about a relative phase between that horizontal and vertical. Okay. Okay. It's similar to spin, right? I don't know. What's your background? Are you a physics student or a... Uh, no, I'm biomedical. Ah, okay. No, I just thought if the spin example would make more sense, but maybe it does. See, if I think about a spin half particle, um, like an electron or a nuclear, even a uh, nuclear spin and so on. Um, then what is the spin half with respect to? So there's always a physical direction which is set by some external magnetic field. And in the presence of this external magnetic field, the spin states are going to take up some orientation, right? So that decides for me what is the plus half and the minus half of the spin state. But once that is fixed, then I can talk about a relative phase between the plus half and the minus half, okay? I hope this clarifies your doubt. Okay, but uh, ma'am, my question was mostly about uh, like in classical, uh, we define one bit as like plus five volt or and zero bit as uh, zero volt. So physically, Correct. we have to see uh, the basis vectors of uh, any qubits. Uh, uh -huh. How do? Uh, yeah, so what I'm describing is a physical realization. That's again a good question from an experimental point of view. Um, how will I finally identify what is zero and what is one? So indeed, it finally boils down to identifying some kind of current difference or a voltage difference like this, right? So if I think of the spin half, right, and I say that I have up spin and down spin, right? How will I detect this in an experiment? So I will have to shine some light on the system, maybe in whatever frequency range. When I say light, I don't mean just visible light. And then I have to read out, right? And when I read out, there's obviously some electronics there where this readout is going to distinguish between these two states, either as a current difference or as a voltage difference, right? So there's going to be two levels and you will say above some threshold or below some threshold, it's going to be kept up and uh, above or below some threshold is going to be kept down. The most physical uh, description is, of course, the polarization, where it's very clear that if I have a filter which will filter out one kind of polarization, then that clearly detects whether I have zero or one, uh, or you know, that that's a more physical way of visualizing. But typically, whether it's uh, spin qubits or superconducting qubits, which is what a lot of the big uh, companies today are doing, all of them rely on these kind of voltage or current uh, detections. Uh, okay. I see, ma'am. So, uh, but in the case of polarization, we have alpha and beta limited to uh, minus one to one, right? So, 
No, they are not limited. Uh, we can discuss polarization qubits in some detail later, but alpha and beta can be truly complex in that case as well. Right? And then you'll have to develop filters accordingly, which are going to detect or measure these things. Okay? So maybe this will become clear as we discuss these things more. Okay? For now, yes, there is, if you want to talk about superconducting qubits or spin qubits, ultimately there will be some electronic way of distinguishing these two things, which comes out as a voltage difference or a current difference. Okay? All right. So let's proceed now to talk about this uh, idea of a two qubit gate. Um, so yeah, the first thing I want to note is that the two qubit gate takes in two inputs and has two outputs, okay? Um, and this is true for all quantum two qubit gates. This again comes from the fact that they have to be these so-called unitary matrices, okay? First of all, note that if I want two qubit gates, then I have to increase the dimensionality of my space, right? Because now I'm talking about two registers. So for now, I'll call these two registers as X and Y, okay? Let me just draw the circuit picture of this gate and I'll explain to you what it does. Okay, so this is what this two qubit gate looks like. Um, this is what is called a C naught gate or a controlled not gate. Okay, you'll see why this terminology. But first note that I'm now writing two qubits in my input and these have to get mapped to some output and each qubit corresponds to one uh, two-dimensional vector, then the two-qubit state corresponds to what is called a tensor product of these two. So this is another concept that I'll introduce formally next week, the idea of a tensor product to create larger and larger qubit systems, right? If I have to go beyond discussing single qubit systems, I have to find a matrix representation or identify the correct matrix representation is larger systems. But for now, I'll just remark that, you see, what are the set of possible inputs that you can have? So this ket x and ket y can be one of four possible inputs, right? It can be 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. And correspondingly, the output can also be one of these four possible things, or maybe even some superposition of these things and so on. But this should hopefully tell you already that we have moved beyond a two-dimensional system to what, what is the dimensionality of the system? So, or Exactly. So we have moved to a four-dimensional linear vector space now, okay? And these then will have a matrix representation which has four entries of this form. So these will be four cross one matrices. So what now will transform one four cross one matrix to another? Well, again, I need matrices, obviously, but what will be the dimensionality cross, of these matrices? Four cross Exactly. Four. So the two qubit gates will be four cross four matrices. And my input space also has four cross one dimension. I mean, is also represented by four cross one matrices. The output is also represented by these column vectors of length four, right? So this is what I will call a column vector of length four. So you see, that's where this picture comes from, that I have two registers, input, two registers to denote the output. And this is what I will, a canonical quantum circuit will look like, that I will have these so-called wires, which will represent different qubit registers. Now, what does this gate do, right? So let me now tell you the action of the gate by looking at these four states. 
Okay. But I hope this part is clear that we need four cross four matrices. And these also have to have the special property that they have to be unitary, which I'll describe. Um, like I said, when I do all the formalism next week. But let's understand what the C naught gate does. So of the two input registers, right? I will call one of them as a control and the other one as the target. Okay. So in this picture, the first qubit is what I will call the control qubit. And the second qubit is what I will call the target qubit. Okay. So I have, I denote this as with subscript C and T to denote control and target. So when both control and target are zero, the gate does nothing, okay? It leaves both of them as they are. When the control is zero and the target is one, again, the gate leaves the state undisturbed. But when the control is one and the target is zero, then the gate flips the target, okay? So the gate flips the target when the control is one. Similarly, when the control is one and the target is one, it again flips the target, okay? So now you understand why one is control and one is target. Whenever the control bit is set to one, the target is flipped. And that is why this is a controlled not gate where the Excuse not operation me, is. Yeah. Ma'am, in the yeah. second result, uh, the control bit is zero. So, I mean, the target is getting flipped. Where? Ma'am, in the second the... Uh, second result, ma'am, what you have written. Oh, 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 sorry, sorry, sorry. This should be one. Sorry, I'm sorry. It does nothing is what I meant. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. Was a, that was a typo. Okay, good. Thanks for catching that. Um, yeah, so when the control is um, zero, it does nothing to the target, okay? The zero remains zero and the one remains one. But when the control is set to one, then it flips the target and hence the name, like I said, controlled not gate. So what is the connection to the XOR operation here? Well, um, if I have to abstract out the action of this uh, gate, here I've explicitly written the action on every possible input. These are the four possible inputs, right? And I've shown you what the four possible outputs are. But if I have to abstract this out and call this as some X and Y, right? Where of course, X and Y can be either of zero or one. And I have to say what, you know, I have to express this. What will I say? The control remains X. How can I represent the action of uh, this gate? What happens to the target? X or Y. X or, of X X or, or y. y. Exactly, exactly. So that is why this is called an XOR gate because it leaves the control as it is, the control qubit as it is, but it actually implements the classical XOR operation at the target. And for those of you who may not recall what the XOR operation is, note that zero XOR anything is the same bit. One XOR anything gives you the complement, which is Y bar, right? It flips the bit. And that's exactly what this gate is doing. It flips Y if X is one, right? So I hope this is clear and I hope this XOR operation also is clear. So you see what has happened is in the classical case, my gates, my two qubit, my two bit gates are simply Boolean functions and they are not reversible, right? Because the classical XOR will take, um, sorry, two bit input. If I were to represent the classical XOR like this and gives me a single bit output, Okay, which will do X, X or Y. But now looking at the output, obviously I cannot uniquely identify the inputs, right? 
because there are multiple inputs which will lead to the same output. It's not a one-to-one -one, uh, function. It's a many-to-one function, right? However, quantum mechanically, we are constrained. So this is an irreversible operation. Okay? But quantum mechanically, we are constrained by certain physical constraints to work with not any set of matrices, not any set of you know, appropriate dimension matrices, but with a particular class of them called unitary matrices, right? This constraint again comes from the physics of the uh, situation, right? Quantum mechanics tells us that there are only certain kinds of operations that you can do on quantum states, and these operations will have to be unitary. And so by definition, oops, I'm sorry. By definition, they have to be reversible okay so in other words by looking at this output so if, so in some sense this this is what you can think of as your quantum truth table right for those of you used to writing truth tables for your classical gates this is the truth table for the c naught gate and looking at the output looking at this set i can exactly map it back to the input right and that's a signature of a reversible operation or a in this case, a unitary matrix. So let me complete the circuit picture. This does nothing. So that's why this dot here, right? So this is a circuit symbol for the C naught. The dot denotes where the control is. And this is the XOR symbol. So this denotes which is the target qubit, right? And so this is X, XOR, Y. Okay. Any questions on this two qubit gate operation? Okay, so having introduced uh, a two qubit gate, uh, I want to finally now talk about a simple uh, sketch, the outline of a certain quantum algorithm. Okay, of course, there are several two qubit gates uh, which will be important and which will figure in some of the algorithms and circuits that we do. Uh, but let me just note here that we again have this universality argument, right? However, unlike the classical case where you had a single gate which could function as a universal gate, here we need a two qubit gate like the C naught, of course, and some set of single qubit gates. These together will make a universal set of quantum gates. And this is one of the things we will study in some detail. What is this minimal set of unitary matrices or minimal set of quantum gates that will lead us to universal quantum computation? Okay, fine. So the last 10 minutes, I want to talk about a simple example of a quantum algorithm. This is the so-called Deutsch algorithm. Okay. It's due to um, this physicist, David Deutsch. Uh, one of the uh, first people to really think about what happens if you compute with quantum bits, right? And this was, this algorithm was actually sketched out in a paper in 1985, okay? Now, what Deutsch thought about is a kind of toy problem. Okay, so here's the toy problem. Now, you're given a binary function. This is just a classical function, right, so to speak, a classical uh, Boolean operation, right? Um, f of x, okay, where x is either 0 or 1. Okay, now we have one of two possibilities, right? In the sense, if if, if um, I input 0 and 1, right, f of 0 can either be equal to f of 1 or f of 0 is not equal to f of 1. In fact, it is simply f of 1 bar, right, because you just have two possible outputs, 0 or 1. 
So if f of zero is equal to f of one, this is a constant function, right? It's, it takes the same value for all its inputs. So this is what we will call a constant function. If f of zero is not equal to f of one, then it means your output has an equal number of zeros and ones, right? So this is what we will call a balanced function. Okay. And Deutsch problem is to identify. So given a binary function f, right? So this is the task. Okay. Given f, identify whether f is constant or balanced. Classically, how would you go about doing this? So when I say given f, you assume that you're given what is often called in classical computing language as a black box. This is simply to say that I don't care or I don't know actually even what goes into this device which is implementing the function f, okay? But I simply am given a device which will compute f of x given x, right? So I'll call this box as f. The input is x, the output is f of x. So this is what we typically think of as a black box where we don't care what goes into this, but its functionality is to implement the function f, okay? So classically, given this, what can you do? Well, you have to input x is 0, find out what is f of 0, input f1, find out what is f of 1, and then check whether f of 0 is equal to f of 1, right? So that's the best you can do classically. This task needs two queries to the black box. What do I mean by queries? I'm basically saying how many times do I have to uh, uh, invoke this black box? How many times do you have to call this? I mean, if you think of this as some subroutine in a program, how many times do you have to call this subroutine, right? I have to call it twice, right? Because I have to give, give two separate inputs, then compute whether f of zero is the same as f of one, Right, and that's how I can solve this uh, task. Okay, but the point is that if I had at my disposal a quantum computer, given this classical black box, I can construct on top of it a quantum black box. Okay, and I call this quantum black box as u sub f. And what does this quantum black box do? If the input is x, it takes two inputs, gives two outputs, right? It does nothing here, but what it does here is to actually compute y xor f of x. Okay, so this is again some kind of control, what I call a control gate. Okay, where the control in the earlier case was simply on the bit value of x, but now the control is actually on the f of x, which is what you would like to probe. Right, so what Deutsch did was to construct a quantum black box of this form, which use the fact that you can think about these kind of controlled gate operations in the quantum case, kind of drawing inspiration from the C naught kind of gate. And now how does this help you? Well, the point is that I can now input here, not just ket zero or ket one, Right, but I can actually input here 
a superposition state of the form 0 plus 1 by root. Okay. So, in particular, let me just note this here and we'll work this out in detail subsequently. But the point is I can input 0 plus 1 by root 2 here. Let's say I fix this to simply be 0. Okay. Then it will turn out that the output here will be a state of this form. It will be 0 f of 0 plus 1 f of 1 i root. Okay. Uh, you can kind of work this out just from what I have written out here. So, the point is that in one shot, okay, so in one query or one input, we have evaluated both f of 0 and f of 1. But now, how do you actually complete the task? Well, you need to compare this f of 0 and f of 1. The way we would do that is there is a second step to this. So, the first step is to construct this quantum black box which can take in superposition inputs and simultaneously evaluate f of 0 and f of 1. So, this is step 1. Step 2 would be to extract information about f of 0 whether it's equal or not to f of 1 this information as a relative phase so there's an additional step here which i will maybe describe tomorrow since I have to stop here now. It's almost 10.50. But we can now, so this comes back to what someone asked me in the first lecture, that you still have to measure at the end. Though you evaluate simultaneously, you still have to measure at the end. And when you measure, you can only collapse to one of these two values. So how is this any better than the classical case? Well, it's better because now I can play around with this little bit. I can extract this information. So, I have to compare f of 0 and f of 1 and that comparison can be extracted as a relative phase. And then I can do a clever measurement so that in one shot, so then step 3 would be to measure and identify if f is constant or balanced. Okay. But the point is, all of this requires just one computation step, rather one um, query to the black box. So, in one shot, we have solved a task which classically required two shots or two queries, okay? So, I'll elaborate on this last part a little bit more tomorrow. Uh, and the, the reason I'm sketching this algorithm up front is because it provides a kind of big picture on how quantum circuits, gates, algorithms really work. It kind of captures the essence of what we're going to do in this course. Questions? Yes, ma'am. One question here. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, when we input uh, x and we get an output y, x or f of x, right? Mm -hmm. But x was actually a superposition. So, does f also accept superposition states? Or, or, because it's only a binary function, right? f is a binary function. You're absolutely right. But I have written down uf. Right? Mm -hmm. So, let's go back to the C0 gate, for example. Okay? Okay. Now, here I gave only zeros and ones as input, but you can right. ask the same question here, right? What happens if I input this? So, let me just do this 
simple example and that will explain this better for you. So how do you query by superposition, right? So, right, right. so let's look at this example of a C naught. So instead of zero, I input zero plus one by root two here. Okay. And let's okay. say that this, oops, this remains zero. Okay. So what is the output? So let's evaluate this. So this means I have the C naught acting on a state of this form. Zero plus one by root two becomes control. Okay. And zero is the target. Now this, by virtue of this being a linear vector space, can be expanded as zero, zero plus one, zero. Right? It's just, it's linear in whatever right. this product is. Remember I said it's something like a tensor product, but whatever it is, it's linear. So this is control and this is target. This is control and this is target. Okay? And this is what the C naught has to act on. Okay? And what does this lead me to? Well, so nothing happens to, nothing happens here because the control is set to zero. But something non-trivial happens here because the control is set to one. So this is actually my output state. It is a state of the form zero, zero plus one, one by root two. Anybody recognize what kind of state this is? I don't know if you have seen states Entangled like this. State. Yeah, who said that? Siddharth. OK, you have already seen this before? or Actually, I was lower. Uh studying quantum mechanics just a week ago to, you know, refresh for this course. Okay. Okay. So, okay. Good. Yeah, indeed. So the output here for the C naught is a state of the form zero, zero plus one, one by root two. And indeed in quantum mechanics, you'll see that this is actually an entangled state. So those of you who don't un, you know who've not seen this before don't worry we will dwell on this in great detail uh by third week of august or something we'll get to entanglement but i just want to note here that since we did this example this is how linearity plays a role right that i can input superposition in the first register i can input a superposition even in the second register right and the gate action will just go through I simply have to expand out my input as these kind of individual terms and then do the gate action on each of them because these are linear transformations, right? If you want to think in terms of matrices, they are unitary matrices and you can see that when I act a matrix on a sum of vectors, it's simply the action of the matrix on each of the individual vectors in the sum, right? So since it's a linear transformation, I can do this term by term, right? And when I do this term by term, I notice that what was originally, you know, uh, some kind of separated state between the first and the second register has ended up becoming a joint state of this form between the two registers, where you see they are now correlated in some way. If the control is zero, the target is zero. If the control is one, the target is one, right? Anyway, we'll dwell on this kind of uh, correlated states and entanglement and so on later. But yeah, this is how. Uh, uh, the superposition will, you know, this is how the gate will act on the superposition. So this is no longer a classical XOR, right? This is a quantum XOR. So similarly, when I have this classical function F, I construct a quantum black box corresponding to that function, which will implement a similar controlled operation like the controlled knot. Right? I hope that answers your question, Siddharth. So this is how this is why it's different from just doing a classical black box. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yeah. Uh, excuse me, ma'am. Yeah. Yeah, ma'am. So actually, uh, yeah. due to some technical issues, I actually missed out some part of today's lecture, the initial part. So I just wanted to know where can I find the recorded lectures, ma'am? Yeah, there's a link which I posted over email, but apparently many of you did not get the email. So I'll post it again on Moodle. Do you have access to Moodle, Avi? Yes, I have access, but I didn't get any link. Uh, 
All right. So maybe the email I missed out because you may, may have registered late for the course. So I may not have your email ID. But on Moodle okay. now, I think you're you're enrolled on Moodle now. So I will post yes. the link where I where I upload the lectures and the lecture notes. Okay, okay ma'am. Thank you. Ma'am. Yeah. Ma'am, can we go to Deutsch problem once, please? Deutsch problem. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Deutsch. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. 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 Uh, Ma'am, uh, while writing the state at the last, uh, like, mm -hmm. uh, should it not be zero and f of one uh, still further? Here. Yeah, ma'am. That final step, uh, zero f of zero, and uh, should it not be plus zero and f of one? No, because the second input is one, right? Here, in the superposition, the second state is one. So the input state here, just like how for the C naught I just now worked out, right? This input state, if I take this by linearity, this is 0, 0 plus 1, 0. Okay. 0, 0 get ma gets mapped to 0, x or f of 0 in the second register. But 0, x or anything is just itself. So that's f of 0. The second one becomes 1 uh, in the first register and 0, x or f of 1. Y is always 0. Right, so it becomes zero x or f of one, and zero x or anything is itself, so it becomes f of one in the second register. Is That's that clear? Thank you. Yeah. yeah, yeah, good. This takes some time to work out, so I would urge you to uh, just do this bracket algebra a little bit uh, to go from this step to this step. Okay, yeah, yes, uh, excuse me, ma'am. Yeah. Uh, here in this, uh, since uh, if we are uh, giving a superposition as the input, then uh -huh. uh, we are uh, the output is zero f of zero plus one times f of one. So uh, that is uh, like we are querying uh, like once uh, we are taking f of zero and once we are taking f of one. So uh, isn't that hmm. querying twice? Ah, that's what I said. So I've not yet told you the last part because I, I didn't want to rush through it in the last few minutes. But I have explained to you the first step. Now you sort of understand what it is to input a superposition state. But I haven't told you how to read out this information. And like I said, we are not going to read out in two steps. If we are going to read out in uh, two steps, then there is no difference between the classical and the quantum case. But we are going to find a clever way. See, in some sense, your system by this unitary, uh, this UF, whatever this uh, quantum black box is, it has already, it has information about F of zero and F of one in one step. Huh. But how do you now compare F of zero and F of one? And that's where your cleverness comes in that you have to design a few more steps here, two more steps to be precise, that you have to somehow get this information out, whether F of zero is the same as F of one. Your black box already has this information. But you have to now find a way of probing this and extracting this out. And I said the way to do it is to think of a relative phase. Like I have 0 plus 1 versus 0 minus 1. I'll have to find a way to get this f of 0 versus f of 1 as a phase. And then I can do a clever measurement to get this information out. And the whole thing will be a one short circuit. So I've only described half the circuit of the Deutsch. So this is half the circuit. There's a there's a few more gates and measurement to be done here before you can extract this information out. Okay, thank you. Okay? So we'll see that we'll see that tomorrow. Yeah. Okay, so it's uh, past eleven. So maybe I should stop here. Um, I just want to note that this kind of idea of using a black box for computation. It's a certain model of computing. Okay, this is called the Oracle model of computing. So let me just note that here for those of you who want to read up about it. Excuse and me. some of you may, yeah. I'm sorry, I'll let you finish. I can ask. No, no, I was just going to remark that. Oh. Um, those of you who know a bit of um, 
I don't know if you read, if you read around and you know that the Oracle of Delphi was this famous temple in Greek mythology where there's this all knowing lady, right? Who answers um, any question you throw at her, right? So that's exactly what this model of computing is supposed to be, that you have this all powerful Oracle or the black box all powerful in the sense you don't quite care about how complex it is to actually run the black box or do the oracle. Even in the quantum case, I haven't told you exactly how to do this gate. Okay, I've just said that there is a black box which is going to do this. And once you have that black box, then as a computer scientist or to, if you want to talk about complexity, you only talk about how many times do I need to ask this oracle? How many questions do I need to ask this oracle? before I get my answer, right? And uh, the, the number of questions here classically is two, but quantumly it is just one, okay? Now, this just seems like a doubling, which may not be a great speed up, but once you start looking at uh, a, a better, a sort of bigger version of this problem, then you'll find that um, there's actually an exponential speed up here. And we'll talk about this a bit more tomorrow. Yeah, was there a question? Uh, uh, I have a request. Uh, Ma'am, could you please provide some reference to papers where I can, you know, kind of complement how these things are implemented experimentally? So that ah, I can okay, kind sure, of sure. look stable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 tomorrow I'll give you an experimental reference. So I'll also give you a reference to Deutsch original paper, which is somewhat easy to read. And I will also give you a reference. So this Deutsch algorithm has been implemented on almost all the architectures. And I'll give you references to that tomorrow. Okay. Thank you. 